Thank you, Ben, uh, and thank you to everyone at Google and Maureen and, and uh, everyone for putting government on a, the agenda of a conference about innovation. <laughs> uh, it's normally the topic that everyone goes, oh, this is probably a great time for me to check my email. Uh, I actually think that the public sector is one of the biggest uh, sources of innovation for us right now, but that is unfortunately not most people's um, perception. Um, and what I'd like to do today is to talk to you a little bit about why I think that is. Um, you should know, of course, that government is not only what gave us the internet, but what gave us platforms like Global Positioning System that's been such a huge uh, source of innovation for the rest of us. Uh, things like the weather, we all thank Google and we thank Yahoo when we check the weather on our phones. It comes, of course, from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And uh, this is yet another platform in which we've been able to provide value to citizens through phones and, and, and consumers through phones and other devices. Um, but I think we've sort of run out of that as an excuse to call government innovative. And you are all looking for other uh, examples of innovation from government. So I'm going to start by just telling you a little story. It's a very small story of one of the fellows teams. We have these teams of fellows or developers and designers who do a year of service with us uh, and how they did some innovation that might spark your thinking. Um, this is our team that went to Honolulu in 2012. Um, so they're, you know, this is one of hundreds of projects that Code for America fellows have done over the past four years. Of course, Tim and I thought Honolulu would be a good city to visit when they, we had a team there. Um, this team was asked over and over again by both people in Honolulu City Hall and the residents of Honolulu to look at the website. They tended to say that's not a job that three volunteers can do in the course of a year. The Honolulu uh, website looked something like this. Um, it was something like 30,000 pages not backed by any CMS, believe it or not. Um, and it was sort of typical of what you see in government websites. It starts with government agencies and departments. The middle is full of press releases. So it's essentially what government wants to be telling the people of Honolulu. But what the fellows said was, OK, we're really not going to be able to fix this problem the year, but let's go look at the problem and at least dig in a little bit. So they started with, OK, I understand what the government wants to say to its residents, but what are the residents trying to find out when they go to Honolulu.gov? So they started with data, which is the Code for America playbook. They went to the search logs and said, well, what are, the what are the search terms? Believe it or not, the first search term is driver's license. And that is not a mistake. That is not a confusion about what level of government handles this. In Honolulu, anyone here from Honolulu, from Hawaii? You got to have some Hawaii people here next time. Um, this, the city actually handles the drive, city and county handles that function for the state. So people were coming, the main thing they were coming to do was figuring out how they get a driver's license. So they typed that search term into this interface and they would get a page something like this. They'd click through one of those links and they'd get a page like this. Now there are about 20 pages like this that tell you a lot of things about driver's licenses. That last paragraph down here tells you that if you're a member of the armed forces and you've returned from service, you have an extra three months before you can you need to renew your driver's license, which was all great information and pages and pages of this, but nowhere did it tell you on the site how to get a driver's license. <laughs> so the team said, we can fix this, and the tech is not difficult. They borrowed uh, an interface from the wonderful team at gov.uk, the government digital service, um, that's done such great work on interfaces to government, and they said, we will create an interface that answers those top 10 questions the residents are asking. And so they, they, they stood up this instance of what they called Honolulu Answers. And if you type driver's license into this, you will get these results. How do I get a driver's license for the third time? How do I renew it? If you uh, click on that second link, you'll get this. It tells you what you need to bring, where you need to go, how to schedule an appointment. Boom, driver's license. This is what, gov this is what citizens are looking for from their governments. So it's great. And they were able to do that in very clean, simple language for those top 10 questions. But then they had another problem, which is they're not going to be able to do that for all of the other questions that the citizens of Honolulu have. You've all been to, I hope, at least heard about hackathons. Yes, hackathons? They did not hold a hackathon because the tech was the easy part. They held a write-a-thon. They got a bunch of people together on a Saturday afternoon at a co-working space about a couple blocks from City Hall. They had about 60 people there, and they took the questions that were inherent in those next 60 search terms, and they wrote them up, and they stuck them on a wall. And all throughout the day, regular old people that they'd met in their course of their work in Honolulu 
people who work in Honolulu City Government, the mayor, other people all came together and they wrote simple, clear answers to those next 60 questions. And they edited each other's work and they checked it for accuracy with people in City Hall so they knew they weren't making it up. And at the end of the day, not only did they have a site that basically answered all of those major questions that people have, but they had a fantastic time doing it. They had a big party at the end. The mayor broke out of a six pack of beers and everyone had a great time, which is not what you normally associate with government IT, I'm sorry to say. Um, so that's not the end of the story. Um, they had a community then that continued to develop it, but that interface was also available as open source software and a bunch of other folks picked it up and set up their own version of answers. Tim and I l spent last National Day of Civic Hacking, which usually happens at the beginning of June, in uh, a co-working space about a block from Oakland City Hall. And we populated Oakland answers. Um, Tim did a really great answer on his, but I, I will just share with you the one I wrote, which is, can you keep chickens? You can keep chickens in Oakland. You just can't have roosters. They're very loud. Um, and we did the same thing there. There's been a ton of other cities, this is only some of them, who have used this technology to create interfaces to their own city government that really work for what you're trying to do. And the couple of stories I'd like you, uh, the couple of lessons I'd really like you to take from this, first of course is, it is possible, despite what you think, for interfaces to government to be simple, beautiful, and easy to use. But you also have to understand that these solutions can come from anywhere and they can spread very easily, and again, that's not what we think of when we think of large, multi-year, multi-billion dollar government IT projects that go through generally a procurement process. Um, but the most important lesson, and I think I would like to um, echo what Vivek Wadwa said this morning, is that no one's going to do this for you. You are your own saviors here. If you want to participate in government, we have to get beyond just complaining about what's wrong. Participating in government means offering not just your voice and your opinion, but your hands, your willingness to actually be part of the solution. And it's so much easier to do that today. Um, we have uh, brigades. The Code for America brigades are volunteer groups that work generally very closely with City Hall uh, in uh, something like 70 cities around the country. I'm sorry, I can't remember the number because it's changing every day. And now there are um, about 130 around the world. These are groups of largely technical folks, but not exclusively. A lot of people who don't have technical skills come to these things, and they meet uh, usually on a Tuesday night or a Wednesday night in City Hall, and they work on open data, they work on apps for cities, and they help the city governments be better at their technology. The great example from Code for Ireland, they wanted to map where the AEDs are, the defibrillators, so that you, when you have, you're doing an emergency response, you need to know if someone's had a heart attack, where to send, you know, where is there an AED to work with these people. They just asked teenagers and their parents to take selfies <laughs> in front of AEDs. And those selfies, of course, are generally geotagged and they could easily scrape that data. It's a great way of just letting people be a part of the solution. But I want to return to that first lesson. It's so important if we're going to really trust and have faith in government that we believe that interfaces to government can be simple, beautiful, and easy to use. And as Ben said, I took uh, the last year and went to DC as the deputy CTO. So I was around for this. When healthcare.gov did not work, it took a really, our belief in that ability took a really, really big hit. And I think we all know that story. Uh, it was on the front pages of every paper, of course, because it was the president's signature policy initiative, but also because I think it, it belies a really deep anxiety. We know that if we can't implement the policies that our government uh, wants to, to pass, the, the laws that we want to pass, we can't govern. And that is a deep place of anxiety, I think, for the American people. But the point isn't that. It's how did it get fixed? It got fixed because a team of people from largely the technology community came together to make it work. This is my boss, Todd Park, Mikey Dickerson, Paul Smith, Ryan Pantajajam, Jeannie Kim, a bunch of people who came together. They worked 20 hours a day for 100 days straight to get that site to work again. And then it did. This was a great headline we really cherished that year. Healthcare.gov is slightly less terrible today. And then, of course, 8 million people were finally enrolled in the program, which was more than they thought we could do even before the site failed. And that's a remarkable achievement that really does reflect that we have a government by the people, for the people. It's we the people who fixed that site. 
But an important thing that we found out, and we knew at Code for America, and that that team found out when they were working on this site, is that the pain we put people through when healthcare.gov did not work, when you couldn't sign up, was really the pain that we put poor people through every day when they have to work with government interfaces. The team came to me one time and talked about how at 3 in the morning, you would see hundreds and hundreds of mobile devices hitting the site. People were waking up at 3 in the morning, not on, on the latest Android phone or on an iPhone. They were on really simple mobile devices at 3 in the morning trying to navigate healthcare.gov because they needed health care. <laughs> Those are people who probably had two jobs, but they set an alarm to wake up because they thought maybe they could get through the site if they went through on their mobile phone at that hour. They didn't have, these are people obviously didn't have a computer in the home. Ezra Klein put this really beautifully when he said this in the, um, in the Washington Post. We're putting these people through this pain and trouble of interfacing with government bureaucracies every day. Now, um, we have found this out through working at Code for America. We went in with sort of an idea that we would make government more efficient, and we have. Um, but this is Alan Williams. He is, came from a hot startup here in San Francisco, worked there for a couple of years, and decided that he wanted to serve his country. He came and worked on a project with Summit County, Ohio last year. And then he decided to stick around, because he met some of the other fellows who were working on a project about food stamps. And they found out how hard it is to be on food stamps how difficult the interface is, how easily you're dropped from the program, because you're sent these very long paper notices that explain to you things that you're supposed to be doing to stay on the program. I have read these notices. I sometimes read them to audiences so that they can have that wonderful experience. I'm not going to do that to you today. But I can't understand what I'm supposed to do when I read these notices. They're not written in language that human beings understand. And Alan and a bunch of other fellows decided to stick around and see if they could fix this interface. So one of the things Alan did was actually, so he's not taking any income right now, and he's living on food stamps. He's calling every day to try to stay on the program and working through it. So this is, and if we could do that video now, this is what you go through now if you're trying to be on the food stamps program. Actually, can we back up to the other, the other one first? <coughs> if, you, if you're applying for food stamps, you will go through about 100 different screens asking for information about you. I think that went a little bit fast. So you probably couldn't see it all that well. But you're talking about hours and hours in a web browser with confusing questions and a confusing interface. So Alan and Jake Solomon and a couple other fellows decided to redo it. And this is what it looks like now. Can we roll that one? There you go. Boom, a lot easier. So this stuff matters. It matters a lot. Um, it matters to uh, the people of our country. And it matters probably to your customers and your clients, too, if you're putting them through that kind of, uh, that kind of difficulty. But I think the point that you, you need to remember is that these people came together to make this happen. We've, it's, it's not all doom, gloom and doom. Mikey Dickerson, one of those people who came to, change, uh, to fix the site, is now at the helm of the United States Digital Service, which is working on making these interfaces simple, beautiful, and easy to use. This is the um, agency that I went to federal government to stand up. And I'm just so glad that he is going to carry that on and make this uh, actually work. Um, uh, he, uh, this team finally put out the US Digital Services Playbook. If you're in a company and you want uh, a playbook for innovation, uh, the O'Reilly Radar was very kind enough to say that this is not just a playbook for government. This works for everybody. This is a fantastic playbook if you want digital services that work for your customers. Uh, the TechFAR handbook, I know you guys probably aren't dealing with procurement the way we were, but shows you that agile development really is the way to go and to make sure that we understand that this is not just a legal way to do it, but actually the preferred way. But the point of all this really is that if we're going to make government work for the people, by the people in the 21st century, which is the Code for America North Star, this is our mission statement, we really have to think about it this way. Government can work if we make it so. We are all responsible for this. And so I invite you to be, to be part of that. Thanks very much. And can I take a couple questions? Any questions? Thank you.
guess the question I've got is, is government actually any worse than many other commercial sectors? I think my driver's license always shows up. I, I just moved states, it went fine. Tax returns, although I don't understand them, that's my fault, they seem to work fine. Refund checks never been lost. Mm -hmm. um, my doctor bills me incorrectly every time. My insurance company clearly never wants to send the money <laughs> that they should. There are just a number of sectors where yeah. actually government looks pretty good. I wonder if you could. My question is if you, if you compare them. Ignore banks, sure. et cetera, which I think have a standard of excellence which, which tends to be above. If you sort of compare sectors, do you believe government is as bad as we all make it out to be? Or is it just one of the sectors that needs improving and there are a bunch of other sectors that need improving just as much? I think that's a really good point and I've certainly heard from people over and over again uh, that um, it's not that different from the corporate world and I've worked in the corporate world, I see the same dysfunctions there. Um, I think the point though is we have to believe that government can work um, because it's our taxpayer dollars and it has to match our intentions. Um, if you don't like a company, you can say, I'm not going to be your customer anymore. You can't decide not to be a citizen of the United States or a resident of the United States um, unless you want to make a very drastic change. And what we're hearing over and over again is, especially I think in the Valley where there's a very strong sense that you know, we could do better. The bar of sort of experience, of user experience is going up every single day. Uh, and, and, and Tim and Urs talked about this, you know, that your, your watch is telling you, you know, leave for work 15 minutes earlier. The data is getting to you right when you need it without you doing anything. Well, the government data is not getting to you right when you need it. And as that gap widens, and it, I, I feel like literally at this point it widens every day, it erodes our trust and faith that our taxpayer dollars are being spent in a way that matches the skills and uh, expertise of this country, but also speaking to the issue of, say, food stamps or home, you know, housing the homeless in a way that matches our values. We pay money into government hoping that those dollars are spent in a way that's consistent with, uh, with you know, the outcomes that we're looking for, and so often we don't see that. But we have to feel that way if we're going to um, continue to support government, and that's what we're really trying to fix. But it's a very good point. It's certainly not unique. Tim? Uh, to... Uh at QE up to say something that you ought to be saying here. Uh, <laughs> you want to just say uh, it? <laughs> Ma Megan Smith, uh, uh, who was at Google, has now gone on to become the new uh, chief technology officer. Mikey Dickerson, who was at Google, uh, went as a volunteer to work on the healthcare at GovRescue and is now heading up this U.S. digital service. So people from Google are heeding that call to public service. Yes. Is there a call to public service that should be going out to everybody uh, in this audience and everybody uh, who works here. Absolutely. Um, thanks, Tim. <laughs> um, I think that is the trend right now. Um, I think it, there is certainly a, a large number of Google people who have chosen to make this leap, and it's because they've gone in and see the impact that they can have. Um, Mikey talked about his recruiting uh, site reliability engineers to the healthcare.gov effort by saying, you're going to learn more <laughs> in three weeks than you would in three years because so many things go wrong every day on healthcare.gov. <laughs> Did you know he was doing that? Sorry. <laughs> it worked really well. Um, but it's not just that. I, you know, I'd like to live in a world where um, startup entrepreneurs, once they have an exit, feel that it's their duty then to go on and spend two years in government before they go do their next, uh, their next gig. Um, they're certainly imminently fundable, but we need them to come to government and have an impact not just on the process but on the culture, and that's what we're seeing happen. So you're all invited to do that. If you have any interest or know someone who is, please see me after. Any other questions? I think probably one more and no. Okay, one more. Where do you think the bar is set highest uh, in terms of government services? Is it? Uh, uh, in Europe, uh, for example, Estonia, or is it, uh, is it elsewhere? Uh, it's a great question, and Estonia is doing wonderful things. It's very hard to talk about Estonia in relation to the size of the U.S. federal government. They're just in completely different categories. I think they have fewer people than Oakland, um, where I live. Uh, but the, there are a number of, um, uh, of countries that are doing a great job, but I would certainly call out the U.K., the government digital service there, which is run by Mike Bracken, has transformed 
uh, not only the publishing of content, but transactions. It's very much a for the people, not a by the people play. But they have absolutely shown that this stuff can work. They're currently spending about a sixth of what they used to spend for services that the, that the British people love to use and are um, incredibly effective. Yeah. All right, well, I think that's the time we have. But thank you very much for having me. <laughs>